Okay, so there's a lot of different uh, kind of ways that people are categorized here. And, and this question of like, you know, are these categories useful? Uh, it, it's something that the field debates extensively. The, the current trend is to try, to try to move somehow away from these categories. Uh, part of the big issue here is, again, this comorbidity that we talked about. This, this fact that, you know, if you have anxiety, you're, you're very likely to have depression and vice versa. And if you have a lot of these other conditions, you're also likely to have either anxiety or depression or both. So if there is this kind of high levels of overlap, you know, to what extent is it useful to talk about these as kind of separate factors? Um, on the other hand, there are, uh, you know, obviously clear symptoms that differentiate these categories. And that's obviously kind of fundamentally what these categories are based on is the actual kind of subjective experiential kind of symptoms that people have. And those are distinct in the sense that you can identify kind of anxiety as a cluster of symptoms that is, you know, obviously distinct from depression. Um, so at some, at some level, it's kind of, you know, one of these things like, yeah, no, duh, you kind of, you know, there are these different kind of states of experience and we should have these categories. Uh, but, you know, it's when you start thinking about those biological bases for these things, um, thinking about the comorbidity, that's when you start to question the utility uh, and meaning of these categories. The other challenging aspect to, to trying to categorize is this kind of continuum of functionality. So, so, you know, there's a kind of quote unquote normal amount of anxiety or depression and then, you know, at what point do you really say, okay, now it reaches this, this kind of threshold of being a disorder. And so that's always a challenge for any of these things. Uh, we'll see, especially with autism, for example, that it's very much a, a kind of spectrum. And so, you know, exactly where the, the cutoffs are is, is always going to be a challenging question. On the other hand, you know, categories, as we know, throughout the whole textbook that we've been looking at, that simplification, a compression benefit of, of categorizing things is just really, really important. Um, and so you do have these clusters of symptoms. You want to group those together and simplify them and say, you know, there's this whole thing about anxiety that is, you know, in some sense, a, a kind of a simpler way of talking about what's going on. And then pragmatically, especially in the medical world, uh, having categories is especially important. Um, so insurance uh coverage you know just codifying uh you know does somebody have a disorder or not uh is very important from a medical standpoint so all of the issues about you know to what extent our medical system covers and treats mental disorders properly is all tied up with the kind of ambiguities about these categories and also uh, about the you know extent to which these are biological uh, in nature or kind of more psychological in nature. So, um, yeah, so having categories is, is pragmatically very useful. Also, uh, it does have drawbacks, you know, at that level of treatment at the medical level, um, given the diversity of things that are actually going on in any of one of these uh, categories, does it reduce the ability to provide, the, you know, the right kind of treatment if you kind of treat to the category rather than to the kind of specific individual. And then being categorized or labeled obviously can be a source of stigma uh, and, and kind of pinning a label on somebody. One of the most compelling arguments against having these kind of categories is the fact that the brain basis for so many of these disorders is really common. And the same basic brain areas uh, are involved in, across most of these disorders. And, you know, not too surprisingly, perhaps, it's really this kind of affective, motivational, control brain areas involving the frontal cortex, critical areas of the frontal cortex, especially the ventral and medial motivational aspects of the frontal cortex, their connections with uh, areas in the striatum, which is the basal ganglia, uh, and then down into the dopamine uh, pathways in the ventral tegmental area. So that classic kind of control network that we've talked about so many times, uh, that motivation and control network through the frontal uh, cortex, basal ganglia, dopamine pathways is really at the heart of this. Uh, the insula is really another kind of, you know, affective uh, somatosensory uh, laden area as we talked about the hypothalamus is very important for uh, 
uh, uh, core low level uh, body state kind of uh, systems. Amygdala, of course, is the most important kind of, you know, affective gateway. And uh, does the involvement of these of these areas sort of, is that a symptom of the overall attractor state of the brain? Uh, the fact that we end up kind of uh, through the sequence of events, challenging our, our personal self-efficacy and our sense of control is that why these systems are, are involved or is it because there's actually a primary kind of biological uh, issue in some of these pathways? And in some cases, the answer to that is more clear than others. Um, and But probably for the vast majority of people who suffer from uh, anxiety and depression, uh, it can be kind of uh, a little bit hard to tell, you know, which way that goes.